So welcome everybody again. Wolfgang Schöfberger is here from the organic chemistry department at the JKU. Maybe you can share your screen and make a short introduction to yourself if you would like to. Okay, thanks Martin. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, lectures for future, scientists for future section up Austria and I copied just this program into and uh, Martin uh, has arranged uh, a quite good program for this semester. So keep uh, or stay tuned to this. Uh, I find it very fascinating, all these um, topics here. So quite a range of topics. Uh, Yes, my, Wolf, uh, my name is Wolfgang Schiffberger. I'm associate professor here at uh, JKU Linz. And we deal with the topic of, amongst others, about uh, utilization of CO2 from, and I named this uh, talk today, from climate killer to new resources. Um, so my research, fields I will describe a little later. First to the content of the talk. So first of all, I want to uh, say a few words on sustainable chemistry. Um, some research projects I will introduce to you. Then I will talk about some general facts about global warming. And in the end of the talk, I will uh, give you a detailed view on electrocatalytic conversion of CO2 into some uh, uh, usable chemicals. So CO2 valorization is the key word. But first I want to make some uh, promotion of the JKU. So I have here some pictures. On the left here, you'll see the Somnium, the rooftop of, of the uh, TNF tower. Here, quite a nice view to, to Linz city. Uh, on the right, the new library, um, then um, the Kepler Hall, where some uh, conferences and some uh, other stuff will be held. There's a gym in the in the basement also, and on the left you have the Open Innovation Center. Um, so. Uh, the Linz Institute of Technology, in short, LIT, will build pilot factories with industry 4.0 technologies on the JKU campus. In this lit factory, new types of tool processes and systems are to be developed and tested. And there we, we will also be included in the future. And here you see some a map of the campus. So JKU has approximately 20,000 students and uh, 3,000 approximately for technical scientists or natural scientists. And here you have the um, uh, science park. There are new uh, buildings built. It is not only three, but I think five or six already. I don't know. Um, here, the rector sits uh, and the library, as you have seen, and on the pond, you have um, a coffee coffee shop. And here on this uh, tower, there is this Somnium, what you have seen before. And behind this tall building, you have the Technicum, huh? where some also some uh, pilot plants are built. There will be another Technicum in a few years. Um, uh, this gives you a glimpse of how labs are uh, look like in our TNF tower here. And on the left, you have the Open Innovation Center. Here, a, just a quick view into the Open Innovation Center where some um, uh, pilot plants or other plants are built. Yeah. Then I said that I will uh, give you give a a few words on uh, sustainable chemistry. So we are in the process of discussing sustainable chemistry uh, uh, teaching module. 
it's a it's a really difficult discussion because some colleagues are not not against it but it's a, it's a discussion to implement but i think it's very important to to make such as at least a study module for interested students so uh, i named this also bioprivileged molecules a new paradigm for bio-based chemical development and i since I'm 16 years already at the JKU and I know my colleagues already a little. Uh, but anyways, I want to implement such a study plan and uh, we had uh, some discussions already how to do this, but I want to give you an idea why I want to implement this with some colleagues. Because the existing, existing economy is, uh, as you know, um, dependent on fossil uh, uh, um, resources. So actually the whole industrial chemistry or technical chemistry is based on uh, two resources, natural gas and uh, liquid petroleum, NAFTA. And this NAFTA or gas is split up in the steam cracker to basic compounds like ethylene, propylene, uh, putadiene, benzene, and other byproducts. And this can be done, as I said, from gas or liquids yeah, in the steam cracker. So basically, you have these several uh, um, chemicals, ethylene, propylene, uh, benzene, xylene, methanol, glycerol. And from this, you build the tree, which is a bad metaphor for uh, these fossil uh, resources. But anyways, you have these compounds made of these simple compounds. Okay, so this is the existing uh, um, way how to to synthesize uh, more complex molecules from uh, basic molecules. And now I want to discuss a little bit about these bioprivileged molecules. What does it stand for? Bioprivileged molecules are defined as biology derived chemical species that can be efficiently converted to diversity to a diversity of chemical products, including both novel molecules and drop-in replacements. And this paradigm was is not new yeah, and it has been discussed over the last several decades. And if you're interested, you can read about it in this paper in, published in Green Chemistry by Keeling and Shanks. And uh, what they present is a way to identify molecules from biomass to convert biologically or chemically to valuable products. So you make from this uh, gray tree, as a metaphor, uh, a partially or a full green tree uh, where the chemicals are extracted or isolated from the biomass. So biology and chemistry can interact to identify molecules. So to identify the sweet spot of branches of the tree to diversify to different products. So here in this array of molecules, which are interesting, uh, basic compounds, there need to be a sweet spot somewhere to identify uh, molecules from derived from biomass to, uh, to um, synthesize further on interesting more, more complex molecules. And one of them is triacetic acid lactone. This is this one in the, uh, in the center. And in this star image, you see, we can synthesize out of this TAAL molecule an array or uh, 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 different compounds, like, for example, sorbic acid or 
lactones uh, or acetyl acetone or high value products like the chirally uh, hydrogenated TAL molecule or progestone, a natural antimicrobial or other kinds of molecules. There are also other, uh, is, uh, there is also another uh, class of compound. This is this muconic acid. And this is a very uh, interesting molecule because you can react this to atypic acid or hexandiol or hexamethylene diamine or uh, other uh, drop in chemicals or novel species like this trans 3 hexene uh, dioic acid, for example. So these are fully isolated from the biomass and could replace later on uh, parts of um, the common industrial uh, derived um, molecules from um, fossil resources. So let's go now to the CO2 uh, side. How can we utilize CO2 or convert CO2? And there is uh, a very good book and you can take a look at it. It's called Carbon Dioxide as Chemical Feedstocks. So how can we convert now CO2 to interesting molecules? And you see the dollar signs here. These are the real interesting molecules. So CO2 with ammonia to uh, urea, uh, CO2 with hydrogen, as you know, to methanol or uh, with epoxides to um, carbonates, cyclic carbonates or polycarbonates. And there are a huge a vast of different uh, chemical uh, reactions uh, where CO2 can be uh, incorporated to other, into other molecules. Okay, so now to the example of CO2, how can we reduce, reuse and recycle it? And my uh, topic in, in the lab here at JKU is uh, to convert uh, flue gas, so purified flue gas with uh, electrocatalytic, with an electrocatalytic process with CO2, then to, um, uh, to other compounds. And I will talk about this later. So to chemical feedstock or via uh, coupling over biotechnology to sustainable food supply or long-term energy storage uh, for transportation and living and here the cycle is closed. So the energy should come from renewable energies for from sun or wind uh, power plants and um, so now to my research fields here at JKU, uh, you know this power to X. So we synthesize catalysts uh, for heterogeneous bracket open photo, bracket closed electrocatalysis. And um, important or uh, important fields or topics are water oxidation chemistry, oxygen reduction chemistry, hydrogen evolution, in future, uh, we might go also in the direction of nitrogen conversion. And today I will talk about the CO2 activation and conversion. Uh, the second project what we, we are doing is we synthesize catalysts for biomass valorization. So what does this mean? We extract from biomass um, for example, fatty acids, esters, oils, terpenes, and activate um, the CO2 and we keep it reacting with, with epoxide, for example, and we synthesize then um, cyclic carbonates. And from this cyclic carbonate, a colleague of mine, Christoph Topf, is hydrogenating in his group with metal and C. At carbon, uh, at carbon systems, yes, as support catalysts uh, via uh, hydrogenation to the um, dialcohols or polyalcohols. Okay, 
So uh, a future project here at the JKU campus will focus also on this uh, strategy. I mentioned it briefly already. So we uh, get from industrial uh, resources, flue gas, purified flue gas. We reduce this in the electrolyzer uh, to formate. This is the formic acid molecule here and methanol. And uh, this uh, aqueous methanol or formate solution um, is then put into a bioreactor. And this is the collaboration with Dr. Michael Egermeyer in future, hopefully here at the JKU campus, where we, um, um, where, where in this bio, uh, bioreactor is yeast uh, inside and the yeast is uh, specially designed uh, that it deals or it grows uh, with methanol or formate, aqueous formate solution. And then you can, uh, the yeast is growing uh, and this uh, yeast can then be isolated, dried and can be used as animal feed or um, bio, and then biochemicals also can be extracted from it. Okay. So now to some general facts about global warming. So the essential core statement of climate research um, have been confirmed so well in recent decades that uh, they are now generally accepted as facts by climate researchers. These key messages include the following. The concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has risen sharply since around 1850 from the value of 280 uh, to 420 ppm. Humans are responsible for this increase primarily through the burning of fossil fuels and uh, building up uh, industry on this. And secondly, through the deforestation of the forests. Uh, CO2 is a climate affecting gas that changes the radiation budget of the earth. An increase in the concentration leads to a warming of the temperature close to the surface, as you know. If the CO2 content of, uh, of the air doubles, the global mean temperature rises by two to four degrees Celsius. The most likely value is around three degrees. And since 1900, the global temperature has been risen about, uh, by around 0 0.8 degrees Celsius. Temperature of the past 10 years were the warmest globally since measurements began in the 19th century and probably for at least a millennium. The majority of this warming is due to the increased concentration of CO2 and other anthropogenic gases. Okay, uh, so we have a problem. So this doesn't come now. Uh -huh. Now I have a problem. Okay, so we have several greenhouse gases, um, CO2, CH, CH4, methane, N2O, and fluorinated uh, carbons. And here you have the climate impact. So CO2 has the lowest climate impact, but it has a dwell time in the atmosphere of around thousand years. Uh, methane is much lower dwell time in the atmosphere um, and N2O 120 years and the fluorinated hydrocarbons around 1.5 1, uh, 1. to 260 years. Okay. So now a few things about CO2 emissions per year. So uh, we, uh, globally, uh, um, there are around 37.1 uh, uh, gigatons uh, CO2 emitted. And here you have the biggest emittance, eight gigatons industry, 3.4 buildings, uh, other sectors, 4.2 uh, traffic, 6.6 .6 gigaton energy uh, uh, economy, 14 gigatons. So you see 
uh, which are the highest emittents here for CO2. And here, uh, the comparison between uh, the six biggest emittents uh, next to, also compared to, to, to Germany, 5.1 gigatons in the USA, 10.9 in China, uh, 3.5 in the EU, 800 megatons in Germany, 2.5 in India, 1.3 in Japan. So you uh, see uh, this. And this is uh, per human being, 16 tons in the US, uh, 10.4 in Japan, 12.3 uh, tons in Russia, uh, 9.6, roughly 10 in the EU or in Germany. Uh, so there's also a change in uh, uh, different countries in the EU and 7.2 already in China. So uh, here, uh, the mix in CO2 em emission in Germany. I won't read it, you can do it by yourself. I will show you now how uh, CO2 is um, transferred over, over the globe yeah, from a seasonal change, a short video. This is carbon dioxide, or CO2, in the Earth's atmosphere. It is derived from a synthesis of observed and simulated data. Reds and yellows show regions of higher than average CO2, while blues show regions lower than average. The pulsing of the data is caused by the day-night cycle of plant photosynthesis at the ground. As CO2 is lifted away from the surface, it is rapidly spread around the world by high-altitude winds. The high concentrations are from the buildup of CO2 during the Northern Hemisphere winter, when photosynthesis is not active and CO2 is produced by plant decay. By July, photosynthesis in the vast vegetation regions north of the equator draws massive amounts of CO2 out of the atmosphere, resulting in low carbon dioxide across the entire Northern Hemisphere. The growth and decay of vegetation in northern lands cause the seasonal change in atmospheric carbon dioxide seen here between March and July. While seasonal changes in vegetation growth control CO2 on monthly timescales, human activities govern long-term carbon dioxide trends. So, uh, now, um, there are a lot of past conferences and then one of the last conferences uh, several countries negotiate the climate change goal and uh, 1.5 degrees celsius of global warming was uh, discussed and fixed uh, not every country took part on it but a 1.5 degrees celsius of global warming um, uh, was was discussed and uh, there's a there's an easy model this is the bathtub model bathtub model model where you uh, very easily see um, what what the calculations are so you have emissions which go into the, this bathtub and the bathtub is filled with co2 in the atmosphere and you have some net removals by the vegetation, by the oceans. And for this 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius global warming, so this climate goal, you have 500 gigatons left to fill the bathtub. Okay. So this sounds like a big amount, yeah, but uh, we have uh, 39 gigatons. 2020 um, in the per year in the CO2 uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. 21 gigatons are uh, removed by ocean and and vegetation. Um, 18 gigatons are left in the atmosphere. So now every year approximately 18 gigatons. Uh, 
are going into this bathtub and uh, the net removal of CO2 is not enough. You're gonna you see this, yeah, by the growing of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, leads then that the bathtub will overflow. So you can easily calculate this. We have roughly around 20 years time when the bathtub is filled. Yeah? So now we need to reduce the CO2. So not uh, from the from our level right now, 20 gigatons down. And here this graph crosses the net removal line around 2065, which is way too late, I would think. But here the red line crosses the blue. So here at this point, the bathtub is 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 not. Uh, increasing anymore, so that the CO2 is not increasing anymore in the atmosphere. Um, so by reducing the CO2, but we can also uh, develop artificial strategies to remove the CO2. Um, and then the, the, the full amount of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, keeps the same at around 500 ppm. So here we're going to see the process, how nature is uh, fixing the problem. So the vegetation um, converts and leaves, it converts the CO2 uh, to some useful product, which is, uh, which are carbohydrates. Huh? Um, the reaction is driven by sunlight. As you do, goes into the leaves, and oxygen as a byproduct is um, exhaled here. Uh, water is needed for this process. I'll start the video. So now CO two goes into the leaf, into pores of the leaf, um, to be converted then in the chloroplasts. You see the nice green color of these leaves and why it is, a, is the leaf green? This is because of this nice looking molecule, the chlorophyll molecule. It's a magnesium uh, uh, metal organic compound. Um, it absorbs at wavelength around 400 to 450 nanometers in the in the violet and uh, blue region and in the orange yellow orange red region um, and you'll see the complementary color which is then resulting in a green color that is why we see in spring and summer nice green colors everywhere. Um, so the CO2 enters the chloroplasts now and in the chloroplast um, there are the tulacoids. These are the tulacoids and on the tulacoid membrane, you see this now, this membrane here, um, there are some big molecules this is the ATP synthase molecule and other big molecules and some small molecules uh, going out of the membrane. So here, you see this. So fully loaded membrane molecule, uh, membrane here with thousands of proteins attached where uh, the photosynthesis occurs. So what do you need for the photosynthesis? You need, need sunlight, the CO2, water, oxygen is produced, and in the dark reaction, um, glucose and sugars are, are produced. Okay. So, and 
the whole process is visualized here. The photosystem two um, protein complex. And you see here the water molecules coming to it. And what happens here? So this is called the water splitting. So the water oxidation reaction and oxygen is produced. And the protons, the H pluses, are diffusing to the ATP synthase, where from ADP, you see the ATP very shortly, uh, ATP is produced. And via energy transfer here to the photosystem one, uh, NADP plus is reacting with H plus uh, in a reductive reaction to NADPH. The whole process is shown here also on the left here. Uh, here you have the water splitting. Four electrons are uh, um, going out of the water, it's oxidized. Yeah? You have these manganese calcium uh, cubane complex where the oxygen is is produced as, as the bright byproduct and it's uh, released throughout the, the tulacoid membrane uh, to the air. And um, here you see the electron transfer over this cascade to these complexes here, photosystem one and the ATP synthase. And on this background, you see the chloroplasts here under the microscope, okay? So, Melvin Calvin then uh, described not only the light dependent reaction, which we have seen already, but he described the dark reaction, which is called the Calvin cycle, uh, where the CO2 is uh, reacted to sugars. Okay, and this process I won't describe here, but it's way too much here, but six molecules of CO2 are bound to this ribulose 1,5 biphosphate molecule and a reduction step is coming to this glycerin aldehyde phosphate molecule and two molecules of glycerin aldehyde phosphate is then uh, converted, converted to glucose. Yeah? So six molecules of CO2 and 18 ATP molecules uh, six molecules of ribulose 1,5 biphosphate, this one, and NADH converts to just one molecule of glucose, and then here six molecules of uh, ribulose 1,5 biphosphate is uh, also formed. So let's go further. So now we understand how nature is doing this. It's converting the CO2. And here we have again these 39 gigatons from energy buildings, industry, transport, agriculture. And um, uh, in total, 21 gigatons are fixated, converted by the land sink or ocean sink. So, what about the rest? How can we de develop a, a strategy to? Uh, convert these extra CO2. And there are some techniques which are known, separation of CO2, absorption process, chemical looping, membrane processes, absorption process, oxyfuel, for example. So we uh, there are some storage options for CO2, geologically storage of CO2, mineral carbonization, methane hydrates, and there are some utilization options for CO2, like synthesis of polymers, what I have shown you already, synthesis of fuels, then synthesis of chemicals, micro, uh, microalgaes, electrochemical processes, artificial photosynthesis is a keyword for this, or the BECS, which is the bioenergy with CO2 capture and storage. So these are methods to utilize CO2. And as I've shown you, uh, 
could we develop um, methods to valorize CO2 now? And I wouldn't stand here if we couldn't. So uh, one can convert CO2, which is a very uh, um, oh. you need to activate CO2 uh, throughout the process, and we'll do it. We do it in, a, in an electrochemical way. So CO2 is can be transferred to methane, methanol carbon monoxide, uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen, urea, polymers, oxalic acid or formate. And if you Google this in uh, the internet, so you will find, for example, the Merck company where they uh, published a future insight price and they uh, describe it like this. The dream product generates high energy density fuel from renewable energy, water, atmospheric carbon dioxide with an overall negative carbon dioxide balance. So this is the goal. And there's a lot of research going on right now. And my lab is playing a very small part in these a uh, competition to uh, convert CO2 in some uh, valorous compounds. So you need to, as I said, activate the CO2 and treat this with water. And by reduction with two electrons, you go to carbon monoxide. And here you see the market sizes of these several compounds, for example, carbon monoxide, or formate, formic acid, methanol, ethylene, ethanol, or methane. And you see here on these reaction arrows, the required electron number. So two electrons for CO or a formic acid, six electrons already for methanol, um, eight electrons for methane, 12 electrons for ethanol and ethylene. Okay. So uh, now the question is, or you could ask me, how can we get the CO2 out of flue gas in German Rauchgas? Huh? And there are some companies doing this already. So like the ASCO company in, in Switzerland or Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, they built already plants, uh, not pilot plants anymore. Uh, it's called amine washing. Huh? So you go with the flue gas into it. You clean the flue gas from solid um, uh, particles. You're going into the absorber filled with um, amines, which are chemicals. We don't know, I need to know it now, but this can absorb the CO2 and then regenerate it. Uh, can, the CO2 is then regenerated and in the end you have 99.9% uh, um, volume percent of CO2, which could then go into physical process where you can uh, make supercritical CO2 out of it. Or, and this is our strategy also, to chemically convert. And we are not doing this with uh, hydrogen in our lab or ammonia to uh, urea or methanol, but we use water and electrons, protons and photons, if we want to do photoelectrochemical CO2 conversion and get then uh, these interesting molecules out. So uh, there are several strategies doing this. So you can use plasma activation, photoactivation, thermal activation, but we are focused mainly on these two parts on the photo and the electroactivation of CO2.
So you need energy to activate the CO2. And on the cathode, uh, you can do that. So what are we doing in the lab? We design catalysts uh, which are based on macrocycles. You see the cycle here of cobalamin, cyanocobalamin. You can buy this also at DM shop in a very diluted version here from Sigma Aldrich. Um, this is the only chlorine system in, in nature. So this metal cobalt, I mean, you can buy, and if you dissolve this, it's, you have uh, an orange red color. And this, uh, we wanted to mimic and we synthesized, and Sabrina Gronklach, my last PhD student, she is now in company, she left the GKU, uh, she synthesized actually a very yeah, similar molecule. This is, call, uh, this is called Corol, uh, uh, very similar to, the, to this cobalamin. And I'll show you now, uh, I hope it works, a model of this molecule. So here is the Corol. And here you have the triphenylphosphine ligand, which is not drawn on the, um, this uh, slide here. But this is the L on the cobalt. This is this triphenylphosphine. Huh? And if you dissolve the whole complex, it's a metal organic complex, you have uh, also a, an orange red color. Um, here it's in a round bottom flask, the whole catalyst. So we can synthesize this in a rather high amount already. And we dissolve this in ethanol here in our lab in a, a three-necked round bottom flask uh, under um, inert conditions. And then we put this uh, on top of a very cheap um, carbon electrode. It can be carbon paper in this case or uh, carbon felt. I'll put this to the camera again. You see it's very flexible and if you look close it's it has a very high uh, surface so uh, the coral can be dropped onto these carbon uh, based electrodes shown here and then you can do electrochemistry on that and if you go to reductive potential you see the, the, the black curve which is under argon the curve and the red curve shows you in this region uh, an increased catalytic current is called the catalytic current and the current current density is drawn on the y-axis of this uh, cyclovoltamogram. This is the units are milliampere per uh, square centimeter. Okay, so we treat uh, the carbon felt or carbon paper electrode with these catalyst molecules. They are on top of these uh, in, in these pores of this carbon-based material and the CO2 uh, diffuses into these pores and uh, reacts with the catalyst uh, on the surface and in the pores of this catalyst support. Okay. And now here you see uh, an animation of the process. The background here is the, is the carbon paper under the microscope. So that's how carbon paper looks like. So now we put the molecules, the catalyst molecules here on the surface. And then we, uh, an electric current is turned on 
and the CO2 is then reduced, for example, to ethanol. Uh, and th throughout this process, here this, uh, on the left side, you see a video of an uh, age cell. So this is the first generation electrochemical cell uh, where we did this study. And on the right, you see also the age cell. And we published this work in 2019 in Nature Communications, where you have this molecule here, which I'll show you now in the camera, um, on top of the cathode, of, on top of or in also in the carbon-based material, in the carbon paper and carbon felt. Huh? And what happens? Uh, if you apply here the potential, this triphenylphosphine ligand goes off. Can you see this? And the CO2 instead of this comes to it and reacts on the CO2, on the cobalt in the middle, coordinates to the cobalt and uh, is finally reduced. CO2 is then reduced uh, to methanol and ethanol. Okay, that's what we have published. So without any reaction with hydrogen, we can convert CO2 to C1 and C2 products. C1 means, for example, methanol formate compounds with only one carbon and C2 products compounds with um, two carbons, ethanol, acetic acid, and so on, for example. So how can we identify these molecules then in solution? So we put in here an internal standard, which is phenol. We know how many protons are in these molecules. And then we compare these internal standard with the developed compounds, let's say formic acid here. Here you have uh, the uh, um, ethanol signals in green and in red, uh, the methanol signals, okay? And comparing these signals with the internal standard uh, leads then to a quantification. We do this with an NMR spectrometer here. This is shown here. This is the magnet. And uh, with different potentials here from minus 0 0.6 to minus 0 0.9, we, you'll see that we have different compounds developed at lower minus values. So at minus 0 0.6, you have almost exclusively methanol here. And at higher reductive potentials, you have uh, almost exclusive ethanol here, okay? And this we sum up into a table. It looks a little bit crowded here, but you see again here, we use different potentials from minus 0 0.5 to minus one. And here you see the different amounts of compounds developed in this uh, in this solution. In the gas phase, we could quantify approximately thirty percent for hydrogen uh, and other compounds. So this was the story which we published there, and then we did another study where we uh, changed from cobalt to manganese, and this complex. Uh, produces at uh, one point minus one point five versus silver silver chloride uh, sixty one percent acetate roughly ten percent on methanol and in the gas phase Cu Co and hydrogen and we published this in Angewandte Chemie last year with a cover image. So what do we need for this? So uh, we need a vast uh, array of different uh, techniques. 
the NMR spectroscopy, which I've shown you for the quantification of the products here. A gas chromatograph for identifying the gaseous products. So we could get uh, a very sensitive gas chromatograph to do this. Uh, another thing is operando spectroscopy, so operando drift, diffuse reflectance, FTIR, UV vis setup, uh, operando spectroelectrochemistry, or operando electro, uh, electro palm, uh, ESR spectroscopy. Um, and all these techniques lead then to uh, the reaction mechanism and chemists are interested to describe what is going on and how it's going on. So we could uh, really show what the process through the reductive uh, reaction of CO2 to methanol or ethanol via six electron reduction or 12 electron reduction looks like. Okay, so a very complicated step. And luckily we have uh, very good equipment at JKU, but not only at JKU. Uh, I, I collaborated with uh, uh, friends in, in Rostock and in Bochum elucidating this um, mechanism. So what are the next steps? In the next projects, uh, we uh, make new uh, electrodes. These are called gas diffusion electrodes where you have a GDL layer, uh, a microporous layer, and inside of this, microporous system you have the catalyst incorporated and gaseous CO2 comes and reacts with the catalyst then to the, the gaseous phase products here ethylene CO and hydrogen and the liquid phase products. So this is the work in progress also uh, joined with uh, the team of uh, Ulf Peter Apfel in Germany at Ruhr University Bochum. Okay, and then uh, Sun He, a future postdoc in my lab, is designing new flow cells. Um, you see here explosion plot of the second generation design of uh, flow uh, cells. Here you have the working electrode, oh, it's getting a little bit too fast here, uh, the counter electrode, uh, and you see this in the next picture. This is the Nafion, uh, the Nafion membrane, which is a sem semi-permeable membrane uh, in the center of here. This is the Nafion membrane. Um, and the third generation design will be uh, the cell stack where you build multiple cells and, and put it together. So this leads to even increased amount of a reduction product out of CO2 then. So this is the flow cell in our lab. Uh, on the left side, you have the cathode side uh, and on the right side the anode side. This is the setup where you have here the flow cell, here a pump, a restaltic pump for example, here the bipotential state where the current comes from, here the CO2 gas supply and here we detect the, the, the current throughout the electro reduction reaction. So this is Sabrina here. This is Dominic Krisch. And actually you see this now in action. Water electrolyte is pumped throughout the cathode and the analyte is pumped 
to the unknown side and it's cycled. And in the cathode side, on the cath in the catholite catholite um, side, the reduction product is accumulating. We see here the current which is uh, detected throughout the time. So it's a, a current to time plot here. And that's what we do in our lab. Okay. So what are the next directions? Um, in an FFG project, we try to scale up now this process. Um, and then we start the full scale testing at JKU. Um, we need to build and attract funding, uh, a CO2 consortium um, here. So this will be roughly our uh, cell then for um, the CO2 reduction in a PEM cell with flow field option. Here you see the flow field option where the CO2 goes into the cell exchanging with the cathode. This is made of stainless steel, can be put together already to a cell stack here. You see this in this uh, graph here, here is this electrochemical cell and uh, maybe in two or three years you can visit us in the Technicum uh, and take a look how we can uh, upscale the CO2 reduction reaction already. So this is the target. Uh, these are the few cell designs, cell stack designs, which we are gonna produce. And this is the goal. Yeah? The sun should be uh, the uh, energy supply or wind energy. We convert CO2 to the liquid phase product and hydrogen. This is my team. I want to thank especially a few person, Sabrina Gongrach, Michael Haas, Dominik Risch, Jessica Michalke, Daniel Timmeltaler and Christoph Topf. And my collaboration partners, Philipp Stadle, Stadler, Halime Koschkun, Al Jabur, Professor Marco Habke, Dr. Christoph Topf, Professor Stefan Müllecker, physicist on the Semiconductor and Solid State Physics Department. And the external collaboration partners are Ulf Peter Apfel from Ruhr Uni Bochum, Jabo Rabe from Leibniz Institute of Catalysis, and Professor Dr. Angelika Brückner, also from the same institute in Rostock. And finally, I want to thank you for your kind attention. There's one question, which is maybe the most important. Will this method save the world? Yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess not alone, right? We are not alone. No, we are not. It's a huge uh, um, community now uh, focusing on exactly this problem. And there are lots of different attempts and with different catalysts, with copper, uh, whatever. So chemists, we need new chemists, students interested in this. So there is a lot going on and you have, you can be really creative in developing new catalysts. But I think in the next 10 years, 15 years, there will be uh, really, a, we are a technology behind this where we can, uh, convert CO2 directly to some some useful products. So this is this is my feeling. Mm -hmm. But I had already a year now of discussion with companies and the biggest problem is that uh, the industry pays. Yeah? They are interested, mm -hmm. but they sit on their money and think, ah, oh, yeah, we will have it in a few years anyways. So um, 
Yeah, uh, I had already very interesting um, discussions on that. Okay, so I think I will just close the live stream and thank you very much for today. And we will have the next, next talk on the 12th of April. So see you again. Thanks. Bye-bye.